that you may believe and have life in his name. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like to tell you about the worst movie I have ever seen. The worst movie I've ever seen was several years ago. It was on cable TV. I only barely admit to watching it. I was watching something else and passed by it several times during the commercials. And it was just, you ever see something that's just so horribly bad you can't look away? This was that movie. It was a movie about a married couple, a man and a woman. And they live in a Chinese suburban house, and they have two kids, two little girls. And their, their marriage is a working, workable marriage, but it's not perfect. As time goes by, the wife becomes skeptical of her husband. She begins to question the truth of what he says as he works longer and longer hours to grow his small business. She begins to wonder if he's really at work. When the man does get home, he notices this doubt, even though it's never spoken. <clears throat> and he becomes a little bit more distant. As time goes by, the wife grows deeper and deeper into her lack of belief in the husband. And as the business goes on, he works more nights. And when he gets home, the warmth of the home gives way to a coolness, making it only easier to work longer hours. The wife notices that he has a pretty new secretary and that he continues to work evenings. And she wonders if the two are related. Is in fact, is he really working? Is he at work at all? Is he with the secretary? Is he bringing home all the money to the family? Or hiding it away or spending it on her? As time goes by, the tone, the feeling in the house gets cooler and cooler. The man becomes more set apart, more self-protective, and the woman becomes ever more suspicious, ever more questioning, ever more unforgiving, ever more angry. And the, the movie shows how the two girls are shaped by this. They don't quite understand it, but they know there's something wrong in the home. At some seemingly interminable point later of developing all this, one night the man doesn't come home from work. It's not just that he works late, he doesn't come home at all, and that's first. So the wife stays up late and then goes to bed, tired and alone, wondering where he is. And the next day, it's up, and he hasn't come home again. So she goes through the mechanics of what needs to be done that way, getting the kids up and off to school, doing things in the house, wondering where he is. And this goes on. And after a couple of days, she's told family and friends, he hasn't come home, I haven't seen him, I haven't heard from him. It's a mystery. Nobody knows where the husband has gone. But the wife is sure that she has been wrong, and believes, and eventually begins to say that he has run off, and that the secretary is probably going to join him as soon as she can. It just kept getting worse. So, at some point, years go by, and you can see that this has shaped the wife's, wife's life. She has become a cold, stiff, very bitter person. And it's affected her children. The younger child believes most of what her mother says, in words and not in words, but misses her father. The older daughter, who has a clearer memory of the father, sees what it's done to her mother with greater clarity than she does believe the mother's version of events. All this goes on. And then one day, they're selling the house. The wife can't keep up the house. It's years later. She's sure that he's run off. And after the business closed, the secretary moved away. And she wondered if, you know, the secretary didn't go to meet him in the island somewhere or, or Switzerland or whatever. And she keeps waiting for the bank account to be depleted, but it never is. But he never comes home either. 
As she's getting ready to sell the house, they do some work in the yard to finish some things up that they've always wanted to get to. And there, beyond the hedge line, at the back of the yard, in the part of the yard that they don't keep, Glad's keep, they find the husband's wallet on the ground. And then the baseball hat he used to wear when he did yard work. And as they look further, and she called family friends to help her, they find that the, the husband has been at the bottom of the well the entire time. I told I promise you, this was an awful, awful movie. Yes. <laughs> he had never run off with the secretary. He had fallen into the well doing some yard work that he had promised to do after having put it off some time, and has been gone this whole time. And the wife has filled in all these things in her head. I tell you this story about this awful, awful movie, partly because I can't shake it, so why should you be able to shake it after having heard it? <laughs> but also because it takes us into this story and a critical moment in the life of Thomas the Apostle. The first time Jesus appeared to the disciples in the locked room, Thomas was not there. Jesus, who walked through death, who walked through the stone that covered the grave, who walked through the door of that locked room one way or another, has walked into eternal life and come as the risen Lord to the apostles, gathered in that room. But Thomas is not there that day. And oh, Thomas does not believe what the other apostles tell him. He says, not till I see for myself and can touch his wounds will I believe that the risen Lord was here with you, or that he is in fact risen. And a week later, Thomas is with them. But that critical week in the life of Thomas, between the first risen appearance of Jesus and the second that Thomas is there for himself, is a critical week, a critical moment in the life of Thomas, because it was in that time that he had all these pieces of information, none of which fit together, and none of which are complete. There are many gaps. There are many questions. There is much to, fill, to be filled in in this story. And Thomas faced a choice, hanging in a space between the two weeks in which Jesus appeared as the risen Lord. Would he fill in the blanks in the story with fear and with his hard-won experience of the pain that this world can cause? Or would he leave that space open for hope and faith? <clears throat> would he leave that space open for hope and faith? How would Thomas fill in those blanks? What would he use to connect the dots? Would it be fear or faith? Would it be the experience of pain that this world teaches us? Or would it be hope and belief in the experience of healing and wholeness and new life of the risen Christ that the, the other apostles had seen, but that he was still working on? And that week in the life of Thomas, that he came back at all to be there for the second showing the risen Lord opened up all other possibilities for the risen Lord to come into Thomas's life. What we do with the gaps between the things we know and understand, how we connect the dots, whether with hope or with fear, makes all the difference in our life, in this world and in life eternal. Hope and faith have a place in our life and they will transform us. We will be healed in this risen life in Christ. Our first task, which the world is all too happy to take from us, is to simply leave that space open where our questions are with room for hope so that faith may come. All these things, the evangelist writes, Jesus did as signs for those who saw and believed. More were done than could be written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe, so that you may have, so that you may come to have life in Christ. 
to be, to be able to say, as the psalmist said, I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. My heart teaches me night after night. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not fall. My heart, therefore, is glad, and my spirit rejoices. My body also shall rest in hope. In hope and in faith. These are the gifts we are given, leaving space for them, claiming them, receiving them as gifts given by our Lord to us is for our whole life in this world and the next. Amen. Amen. Amen.